It's a term you hear all the time, but no one ever explains what it means. You know what I'm talking about. It's the buffer overflow. In this video, what does that mean and how can you exploit one to get code control on a system? And you can actually follow along with me and do this with me right now. So here we have a piece of code. And as you can see, it all starts with a little bit of bad code. So we enter our code here by calling the main function. The main function is the entry point to any major C program and we call bad code. Now, what happens in a buffer overflow scenario, as the name implies, is we read a big amount of data, one that is not small, 64 bytes, into a very small buffer, one that is 32 bytes. But again, why, why is that bad? What could go wrong in an overflow scenario like this? It all comes down to a very simple computer architecture concept. When we call the bad code function, right? In code, we write functions that are small snippets of code that tell us that we're going to do some action. But at the end of the function, we return, meaning we come back and go to the next line. Line 18 gets ran, the procedure inside of bad code executes, and we go back to line 19. The question is, how did we know to return to line 19? Great question. When we want to tell the computer to go somewhere else, to run code at a different location, there are two primary kinds of instructions that we use. The first one is the obvious jump. A jump literally means, hey computer, go run the code over here. And that over here is this address 8049130. The computer will literally just go to that location and try to read and run the data that lives there as code. Very simple. But the problem with jump is that if we just jump to a location, there's no information that gets tracked about where we came from. So enter the call instruction. What the call instruction does is not only jump to a location and begin to run the code there, but it also pushes the address of the next instruction to be ran onto the structure known as the stack. The stack is just like a notepad or a scratch register where information is put about our program. So when this instruction gets ran, temporarily, this value, the next instruction to be ran, is stored for later use. And so what ends up happening in our program is main runs, main creates a stack frame for its memory, bad code gets called, and it pushes the address of the next line onto the stack, and then bad code gets to run, and it creates its own stack frame. What this looks like in memory is this structure here. We have two different stack frames that are going up negatively. If that confuses you, don't worry about it. It's not super important. But you may begin to see a bit of a problem here. If we are able to overflow the buffer of bad code's memory, some buffer is too small and data gets to overflow past that buffer, we're able to overwrite the return address. But what does that fundamentally mean? What it means is we can actually tell the computer where to go next. We, someone who did not write the program, gets to tell the program what to do. That's absolutely crazy. Now, I do want to be very clear that there have been a variety of mitigations put in place that stop an attacker from doing the exact attack we're about to do. There are things like the stack canary, position independent executable, as well as the fact that the stack is not naturally executable. All of these things are default mitigations by GCC that for this video, I had to disable them. So I wanna be very clear, right? This is not like just the modern state of software, but for somebody who's getting into hacking and into, into the world of software security, this is the big wake up call that shows you like, oh, data and control information are mixed. And if you get to control one, you can control the other. Let's compile the program and run it. So we do GCC here to kind of, you know, disable all the mitigations, but the proof of concept is still cool. We disable this and we're gonna run our program here. Remember from the code, we had a big amount of data, 64 bytes getting read into a small buffer, 32 bytes. I'm gonna copy in this big long string of data that is significantly over 32 bytes. And you'll notice something happens. Obviously the program crashes, we get a segmentation fault, which means the program tried to read memory in a page that was not mapped into the process. What's cool though, is we can do sudo d message, which gets the information from the kernel about why a program failed and pipe that into tail. What you'll notice here is the last instruction that we ran, the last thing that failed, was a segmentation fault at 45454545. We'll go into Python here and I'll say bytes.from hex on 4545 Guys, that's E E E E. Are you shocked? If you're not, what just happened was we were able to write data in the bad code memory location, A, 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 B, 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 C, 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 D, 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 et cetera. And it just so happened that E, 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 E landed in our return address. We were able to overflow the buffer and put this spot into memory so that the computer tried to go to E, 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 E as a location and go and run that code. 
So if we have control of the program counter, what can we actually do with this, right? Well, if you read this code, you'll notice that we have bad code get called, main gets called by default, but there's this other function called debug function that we don't actually call. What we can do is we can literally overwrite the EEEE, -E -E -E, the place where the computer is supposed to return to, with other code that isn't intentionally called by the program. We now have control of where the computer goes next, so we can just plug in the address of debug function and we could just go there. Let's try that right now. So what we'll do is we'll do an object dump on the program, pipe it into less. This gives us the assembly breakdown of all of the instructions. And now we can see like the addresses of things like in it, the addresses of things like libc start main and the PLT. But we can then go to debug and go find the debug function address. We now see that it lives at 08049186. So we'll copy this. Our long payload was fine, but the problem is the long payload was able to be typed by a keyboard, right? I can type all these things out with my keyboard, but special characters like hex 08 and hex 04 are not in the ASCII range. They're not a character I can push in my keyboard. So what I have to do is actually use Python here to do a little bit of Python command line food to give me the ability to print via code non-ASCII characters. So what we can do is we can use Python to run system standard out buffer write to write arbitrary binary data to the command line and then pump that into our program without having to use special keyboard characters that we can't actually type with our fingers, right? So we'll just copy and paste that payload here and make sure that we're getting the same kind of, uh, same kind of access, the same kind of control of the program. So we print it, which works. We're gonna actually print it and then pipe it into our program. And then we'll do a little D message again. And then here at the bottom, we are still in control at 45454545. So great. So now we can literally put in whatever address we want, right? We saw before that address was what? The address was 08049186. Let's go ahead and do that real quick. So we could, just put it here and then have to escape them out to make them actual characters, right? This is just the hex value. We want to turn it into actual characters to type. But the problem is this is the big endian encoding. The biggest part is farthest to the left. Intel, the current system that we're exploiting is a little endian architecture. So I want to do 86910408. We want to take the order and flip its endianness so it matches the target architecture. And if we do this, we should get control of the program. Now, what you're seeing here is that we are entering the secret function. Remember, if we go to the code, we'll see that there is a printf occurring. So that means we've actually landed in the debug function. But what should happen is that it should give us a shell. It should run system bin sh, but it's not doing that. Why is that happening? Well, what's actually going on here is the file descriptors that allow us to type, right? Like standard in and standard out are open on our computer. They get closed when we run this pipe and that input goes into overflow and it gets processed there. So because they're closed, the shell is spawning, but we're not actually able to interact with it, right? So what we have to do is this thing that I like to call the cat trick, where we do this command, right, on the left side. And then what we have to do is on the right side of this command, after that, do and and cat. And and cat keeps the file descriptors for this part of the pipe open. So when we pipe it into the overflow command, it keeps it open for us. We've entered the secret function. If I type ls id, I have a shell on this computer. Now I do want to highlight, right, this, this is my computer. I have it locally exploited a local program. But if this were a vulnerability on somebody else's system, if I were running this program on your computer, this would work for your computer. I want to highlight here, guys, this is a very elementary example, right? This is literally like 1990s, early 2000s hacking. As I mentioned before, if I go to the GCC uh, flags for this function or for this program, I have disabled stack canaries, a secret value that forces you to know something about the program before you can exploit it. I have disabled PIE, position independent executables, that allows the kernel to randomize where that address lives, right? Again, we have this magically hard-coded value, 08049186, but in a PIE binary, the default for GCC nowadays, this gets randomized. I have no idea, sort of, I know where the bottom part of it is. I don't know where these top two bytes are, and that's only for 32-bit. In 64-bit land, the amount of memory space gets increased exponentially. It's a power of two, right? If this interests you, by the way, guys, check out Stack Smash pinned comment that goes live in January. And uh, yeah, man, it's gonna be a good time. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you learned something. I hope this kind of unlocks for you the memory corruption, the software safety part of your brain. So you kind of understand like how do hackers get in from a buffer overflow? This is it. It applies to a bunch of different scenarios, much more complex than this, but this is like the fundamental piece and it's kind of neat. See you next time. Goodbye.